The Locked On Podcast Network presents the NBA Big 3 in 30. The three biggest stories in the NBA from our local experts at the Locked On Podcast Network. We bring you the real story, why it matters, what's next, who wins the big game, and more, all in 30 minutes. The NBA Big 3 and 30 starts now with the biggest story in the NBA. Miami secure a win over Dallas in overtime. You are locked on Heat, your daily Miami Heat podcast. Recording this after the Heat's 123 to 118 win over the Mavericks. A little closer than maybe we thought. Too close for comfort, in my opinion, considering that A, Miami was on a rest advantage, B, they were at home, and C, Dallas was without Luka Doncic. Uh, It does take overtime, but the Heat are back to 500 on the season. David, can you feel good about this one if you're the Heat? I don't see why not, to be honest with you. I understand the loss of Luka is, you know, obviously it changes the dynamic in Dallas considerably. He's a star-level player, superstar, really, an MVP-type candidate. uh, But he had been struggling all year. There had been problems with Luka's game for most of the season. And you wonder whether or not, had he been in the lineup, how it would have impacted Dallas's approach overall. But they had plenty of contributions from across the board. Kyrie Irving was phenomenal tonight. And we've seen teams in the past kind of step up in the absence of their star. This is the same team that had been able to knock off Denver recently. And, you know, they're they they they're a good team. They're a very good team without Luka Doncic. And I don't think it really mm. changed their approach all that much. Having said that, I think Miami played a really good game. They were led by Jimmy Butler. He was phenomenal. And they did everything they could to really try and impart their will and kind of just change the course of the game, kind of dictate the way that things were flowing. And they had a lead in the late in the third quarter. I think it was a 10-point lead. And then, unfortunately, that was squandered. But the, the fact that they were still able to pull out a win, that they showed the kind of grit and tenacity that you would hope this team has Absolutely. I think it's a great win. I I really do. I don't know Mm. if it's a signature win or anything like that, but I think it's a really solid win that you need to be able to log on as as the team has struggled early. They've had a lot of close losses. And so when you can get a win like this, albeit with a shorthanded team, and you can point to Miami being without Terry Rozier. Now we'll debate whether or not that's a positive or a negative later on. But either way, with Dallas being without Luka Doncic, Miami took advantage. They capitalized and they got the win. Absolutely. It's a great win. Yeah, there, there's kind of different ways to look at this, isn't there? Like, at one hand, you're, you're, you know, beggars can't be choosers. This is a team that was mm-hmm. below 500. You got back to 500. At the same time, man, it really feels like this one should have been put away a lot earlier. They were up by 10 um, in the first half. They kind of blew that lead. They were up in the fourth quarter. They blow that lead. They go like two, three minutes again in the fourth quarter without scoring. Dallas gets back in the game. Um, they miss a ton of free throws in this game. 17 mm-hmm. of 27. They missed 10 free throws in this game. Um, the refs did not help at the end where I think, you know, Jimmy Butler had to have a last second dunk to send this game into overtime. He got fouled on that dunk by Derek Lively. It was pretty clear. Uh, the yep. officials missed that and an obvious goaltend earlier in the game. Um, so, look, there, there's a lot of reasons why you could say, like, yeah, man, they should have they should have kind of easily won this game. I mean, they haven't. This is their second game in a week. The last time they played was Monday. Yeah, like- Dallas is on the road two games in three nights. Like, but at the same, they don't have Luka Doncic. I disagree with you. I, I think not having Luka really changes a lot for what Dallas did. It kind of feels like if Luka were in this game, they might have won. And all that yeah. said, I go back to what I said before. Like, beggars can't be choosers. Beggars can't be choosers. And the Heat are back to 500. And you can also look at it this way. They did not play their best game despite the five days off, right? There's no excuse to not have played a better game. There's no excuse to miss 10 free throws. But the fact that they did miss all those free throws and didn't play a great game, but still managed to get a win could also be viewed as a positive, right? Like good teams win games that they're not supposed to win anyway. And this kind of feels like one of those games, except they were always supposed to win this game. So I'm, I'm, I'm a little uh, conflicted here. If you can't tell. Yeah. It, it's I mean, look, I can, I get that. Uh, but you could also point to Russ, you know, and, and my point about Luca, obviously he, he has a, an impact whenever he's out there, but the, the team changes their approach. Like they're going to him and there, there's a lot of, there's a lot of watching as he makes plays because that's who Luca is. He's just he's the engine and he drives what Dallas is capable of doing. And that could shoot them in and out of games just as easily. And he has, like I said, struggled throughout the season despite some pretty big games. Mm-hmm. I think overall And they are on this win streak without him, to your point. Or they were yeah. before Miami snapped it. Yeah. Very good point. So I I mean Miami, absolutely. I, I think they should feel confident winning two at home. 
being able to show that kind of tenacity again, like that, that they didn't back down. The missed free throws, yeah, that's a What's concern. going on with that? I don't know. I don't it's, know. It's a season trend. Like, why can't they hit their free throws? Yeah, I mean, it was mostly Jimmy, really. What did he miss? Like five free throws? Jimmy missed five. Tyler split his. Kevin Love went over two. Burks went one for two. That was pretty much yeah, it. Those are Kyle guys Larson that don't generally shoot the line. I mean, Jimmy. Dallas is a team. Dallas is a team that puts their opponents at the line a lot because they're physical, because they like playing defense, because they they use their bigs uh, aggressively on defense, et cetera. So, I mean, they're they typically do send teams to the line pretty often, but it was just Jimmy kind of dictating terms and figuring out, look, I can get past anybody, whether it was a wing mm -hmm. defender or whether it was one of their bigs, and he was able to draw fouls, just unable to hit them. The, the Burks free throw towards the end of the game, that was a tough one to lose. But again, this is a guy who doesn't shoot free throws. As much as he is a veteran player, he doesn't really go to the line all that much. Kevin Love also not a player who really goes to the line that much. So um, it was unfortunate, you know, had they split those, you know, well, I, Burks did split them, but I mean, had Love notched one more free throw and Jimmy, you know, maybe it two or three of those five misses, maybe they wouldn't go into overtime in the first place, but they missed them and they still found a way to win. So absolutely. I, I feel encouraged by it. The Heat win this game just because nobody shot well in this game. They didn't shoot as poorly nope. as Dallas did overall. Uh, the Dallas shot 42% overall, missed 30 of their 40 shots from three point range. Um, Spencer Dinwiddie went over nine. That's yeah, bad. That, that's that's crazy. Yeah. Um, yeah, so uh, Tyler Hero went one for ten, so he missed just as many, but at least he made one. Yeah. Um, yeah. and that was really it, right? They go Miami goes fourteen of forty-one. They shoot thirty-four percent as opposed to twenty-five percent from beyond the arc. They shoot forty-three percent as opposed to forty-two percent. That's why it was a close game. You know, small margins, but that's what happens in a game that goes to overtime and you win by five points. Um, everything else was pretty much the same. Points in the paint. Like yeah, fast break points, lineup. turnovers, like yeah. nothing, no real huge swings in this one. But Miami was able to uh, to kind of eke this one out. Um, Jimmy Butler. I know we're going to probably talk about him when we get to our credit cookies, obviously. Sure. <laughs> I love the broadcast saying he's got 60, 63 points in his last two games. And I'm also like, well, he's also got 63 points in a week. Like, <laughs> you know, it's played two games in, in a six day span here. Um, but Nonetheless, two very strong back-to-back -back games for Jimmy Butler. And I love the way that he was attacking in this game, especially in that fourth quarter in overtime where it was clear that they needed to get uh, somebody going. Tyler Hero was yep. uh, awful in that fourth quarter. He just couldn't hit anything. And Jimmy Butler came in and start, and, and it was a bad game for Bam also. Like, this is this was a win kind of carried by Jimmy Butler in a lot of ways. Oh, no. Not, not, not in a lot of ways. Like, in every way. Like, he, he yeah. was the sole driving force responsible for Miami's win. And so... Like, I get it. Um, maybe I'm choosing to look at this much more half full than half empty. Uh, the fact is that he played well and he was rested. And that's what you hope for. Like, I mean, he didn't show signs of rust. He right. didn't show any kind of lingering injury issue. Yep. Yes, Every, all the, all, all that stuff that I was talking about, like, why why did they play like that in the five games, in the five days off, all that stuff, does not apply to Jimmy Butler. He was great, except for the five missed right. free throws. Right. <laughs> It's gonna seem like you have an agenda. I gotta be honest with you because you keep bringing this. I'm up. just telling. I mean, like, I'll, I'm just saying the free throws were weird. Like, what was going on with that? I'm just. But Jimmy Butler yeah, was a great no, game. I told him nothing. None of that stuff applied to him. He was great. He was the best player on the court, and he was supposed to be, especially with Luca when Luca was out. Like, he is qualitatively the best player in this game. He's better than Kyrie Irving. He's better than anybody else on any of these teams. The thing with Jimmy is when and when he plays like that, the Heat tend to win games. So yeah, I close blowout, whatever. The Heat don't blow anybody out anymore unless they're the Philadelphia 76ers, I guess. But yeah. Jimmy was the best player on the court tonight. Absolutely. Every other player had five days off and they didn't play as well as Jimmy, too. So I mean, exactly. I think it goes to show that when Jimmy is as engaged as he is and aggressive and gets to the rim and finds his spots, like he was just, you know, hitting tough shots and and, and finishing at the rim, like. The, this was the kind of physical type of game that Jimmy has mm. historically thrived in, and, and he certainly did tonight. No three-point attempts for him. Yeah. 11 for 17 from two-point range. Had that crazy Dwayne Wade-esque circus shot. Just yes, a great game for really Jimmy. Nice. Great game for Jimmy. Absolutely. Game Time has a new feature called Game Time Picks that makes getting tickets for your favorite live events even easier. Game Time Picks filters out the fluff to show you only Incredible deals on great seats, so you don't have to waste time searching through thousands of tickets. Curation makes it easier to save on sports, concerts, comedy, theater, and more near you. 
You can take the guesswork out of buying tickets with Game Time. Download the Game Time app, create an account, and use code Locked On for twenty dollars off your first ticket purchase. Terms apply. Again, create an account and redeem code Locked On for twenty dollars off. Download Game Time today. What time is it? Game Time. What the heck is going on with Zion Williamson? Jeez. You are locked on Pelicans, your daily New Orleans Pelicans podcast. Again, I don't think there is anything to him wanting to force a trade or anything like that. I don't think that has anything to do with the new representation. I think he just wants a change for whatever reason. And maybe that's misguided. I think that's fair to say. CAA would give you any resource you want to kind of make the most of your career. And maybe Zion wasn't doing that. And no, frankly, that's not a good thing to not take advantage of the resources that you have available to you, especially when they're easy, they're free. They're not going to cost you anything like that. Just like why you should take advantage of the free daily locked on Pelicans newsletter. It's a mistake not to. All right. Anyway, you get what I'm saying though. Like, yeah, it might not mean anything in terms of wanting to trade or whatever, but it says something about his mentality, his thought process and how he's approaching his career. You know, that viral video, it's old. It's not actually recent. It's old. It is what it is, right? He wasn't like that coming into the season. That's good. You can argue that maybe he should never be that out of shape, and you'd probably be correct, but we know he needs to do more, and he needs to do more. It's as simple as that. If he doesn't, then it's going to continue to impact him in a negative way like it is now, and that'll get into the can you trade him stuff that we're about to talk about here. But let's look at the injury timeline because that also came out from Sham Sharani on Friday after Zion had talked to the media saying, I'm on track. And then Shams comes out and goes, they're bracing for him to be out way longer than the four to six week timeline that was put out there. But here's the thing. The Pelicans did not put out a four to six week timeline. When they announced the press release after the imaging, they said indefinitely. So Sham Sharania somewhere came up with a four to six week timeline. They didn't tell him that. I can tell you the team didn't tell him that. He, 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 wherever he got that, He got it, but it wasn't what the team was putting out there. Now, maybe it's just four to six weeks is the usual thing for these hamstring injuries. That's what Jose's is. It's a similar injury. But Zion probably isn't on a four to six week timeline. That timeline is somewhat artificially created and not necessarily accurate. So the team wasn't really bracing for anything for him to be out longer than four to six weeks or whatever, because that's what their expectation was when it comes to all of this, right? So... It's been two and a half weeks. It hasn't been four. It hasn't been six. Nothing is technically like off schedule yet. One, because there was no schedule in the first place. But even if it's four to six weeks, it wasn't. We knew it was always going to be the six-week timeline. I just went and filmed um, over at Fox 8 for their Fox 8 overtime. That's on Sunday night, 1030, I think, if you're listening to this before that. You know, they, I was asked the question by Madeline Adams. And she goes, you know, do you expect it to be longer? It was like, yeah, based on the history, like, of course. It's going to be longer. That just is what it is. Again, you can look at that and go like, there's no way you can keep building around this guy. It's time to just move on because this isn't how a team can really just build something for the future. And you'd be correct in saying all of that. He needs to do more. And if he's not going to do more and going to a different agency, isn't necessarily going to change anything. Well, then it probably is time to move on here. But you know, you look at kind of the injury timeline there, it's, it's exhausting, right? We don't know when he might return because of all of that. And so I, I, I think that's an important distinction to make. He's not behind. He's not off schedule. The team's not bracing for anything right now because they weren't expecting him back in four to six weeks. They never thought that that was necessarily going to be realistic. Now he might. And then what's also exhausting about this is when he speaks to the media the other day, and one of his comments was, was really important to kind of look at. And this also is going to lead into the, should they trade him kind of thing? You know, he said when asked, like, what can you do? And he was like, well, if you ask me, I can, I can do a lot. Kind of basically saying like, I can do more than the team is letting me do. It seems like we're gearing up for another Zion versus the medical staff battle. This is round four, five, six, something like that when it comes to it. This is going to be the theme of the show. That's exhausting. They revamped it to kind of appease him, appease Brandon Ingram a year ago, all of that. And it worked for the most part. And now it seems like they're kind of butting heads again. Now that's one little phrase, one little line, one little word. And maybe that's not the, the, you know, we don't want to read too much into that, but it's exhausting 
you know, it, there's a moment where your life's not going the way you want it to do. This is, look, I can speak from this personally. I've been in positions before where you kind of like wake up one day and you're like, I can't keep doing this anymore. I, I, I can tell you there was a point a couple of years ago, it was during the Suns playoff series. I was being really unhealthy. I was up late doing bonus shows, things like that, covering that playoff series for y'all, like eating unhealthy, not getting enough sleep, like not working out at all. I just was tired all the time. And one day I was like, I can't keep living like this. I started making changes, serious changes to my diet, working out all of that. And I feel a million times better, but sometimes there's other things in your life where you wake up, you're like, I can't do this anymore. The team feels like they're kind of at that point of, can you keep doing this? Right. Even if Zion did all of the right things this off season, and look, by all accounts, he did this injury still happened. So there's more you've got to do, but if Zion's not going to do that, you're going to run into the same situation again and you just can't keep living this way. Right. And you look at all of these things again, all of it might be nothing. It's been two weeks, right? Nothing's necessarily off schedule despite the shams report, but the bad management, he has enough money to get a fixer to make that video not appear, right? Even if there was something contractual with the artist, he could absolutely be doing more to take care of his body. Even if he did a good job this off season, it's the weeks it took him to talk to the media two and a half weeks. He chose not to. That's not great. Control the narrative rather than letting it run amok. But that's something that he's done his whole career. You know, these might be minor, but they show bad choices, bad process. And that adds up. And it feels like it's a big, big load to bear right now. So could they actually move on from Zion Williamson? Can you flush it this season and do all of that? I'm here to tell you the bad news is the answer is no. I don't think he has any trade value around the league right now because he doesn't play. And for all of the reasons, if you're someone who wants to trade Zion Williamson for all the reasons that you want to trade him is all the reasons why another team's going to be like, absolutely not. You know, the opportunity to do that was probably this off season or the off season before that, when they've kicked the tires on all of that. But look, they probably looked at Zion. They had people around him all summer. He was doing all of the right things and it felt like this would be okay. And it turns out still no. So even when you're doing the right things and it's leading to all this, that's not great. Right. And then you look at his contract and again, I'm not reading too much into the non-guarantee and all of that stuff. He's making $36.7 million this year. He's missed 11 games. Who's going to pay that next year. He's going to make 40. The year after that is $42 million. And then the year after that is 44.8. Is anyone going to really take that on if Zion's not going to be playing or going to be dealing with these injuries? Now, the one good thing about those unguaranteed clauses in his contract, which based off weight and other check-ins and other things like that. And again, it doesn't really matter is that maybe means the contract's more tradable, that a team could give up relatively little for Zion and go, okay, well, if it doesn't work out, we just cut him because we won't owe him the money because the, the rest of the contract's not guaranteed. You can trade it and it gives a team trading for him some protection, but you're, they're still not going to give up a lot and be like, yeah, we'll trade a bunch of assets and then worst case is we just waive him. No one's going to do that. So that presents part of the problem with it, right? He's kind of at his lowest point. Same thing with Brandon Ingram this past off season. That was one of the things that kind of came about from all those conversations of trading him and what have you of no team wanted to do that because his, you know, wanted him after a bad playoff series. So you'd be trading him for pennies on the dollar in a sense here. And maybe you just need to do that to move on from Zion, but that's going to put you even, even in a worse spot if you're not getting things in return from him, or if you were to just wave him outright. So that doesn't put them in a good position either. So it just basically means they hope he comes back. They hope that they can look good and that this isn't a fully lost season for the New Orleans Pelicans. So they are still in position where things could make this year worthwhile, I think. And we'll look at the best case scenario for New Orleans coming up in the next segment here. And that's Zion Williamson and New Orleans. But I don't think... It, it's very realistic for them to trade him right now. This offseason, yeah, but then you want him coming back and playing and playing well to kind of build up some of that trade value again, you know, leading the Pelicans to a play-in tournament spot, something like that. That would go a long way towards all of that. It sounds like he could be playing by January, mid, you know, late December, early January could be a realistic thing. The season might be lost at that point in time in terms of making the playoffs, but all this other stuff, it's just... It's tiring, even if it means nothing. And I don't think, again, I don't think him changing agencies from, from the people I've talked to with this, like that it matters at all 
truthfully, right? Like at least not for this season or anything like that. To me, it's like immaterial when it comes to his contract and things like that. It just shows, man, you had one of the best agencies in the world. From where it sounds like he's going to go, it's a good agency too. And it's not like they're going to take bad care of him, right? But it's like, you're not going to get other resources that you didn't have available before necessarily. So if you didn't take advantage of them then, and now you're like, screw those guys, I'm leaving. And that's what it was. It wasn't CAA dropping him. That it says something, right? Like it says something and it doesn't say something good. And I think that's the overall concern with this. So it's not so much that he's doing this. It's just, well, then what does that say about his process, his preparation, his mentality of who he listens to and all of those things. And I think that's what's so concerning about that. The missing, the timeline and stuff, there was no timeline set. We shouldn't go off of Sham Sharani and just kind of bringing one up and you could say, well, four to six weeks is the usual timeline. Yeah, but that's, that's an average timeline. There's people above that and there's people below that. And Zion, given the injury history, was always likely going to be above that. There's a reason the Pelicans didn't put four to six weeks on there because they weren't necessarily expecting four to six weeks, right? So I think they kind of saw that report from Shams and was like, what the heck? And we're not happy about that because that was not something that they really communicated to him when it comes to all of it, right? Like, even that video, the tattoo, like that shouldn't be a big deal, but in the grand scheme of everything else, it's just another little thing that adds up and that is exhausting and that is tiring. And people just don't want to do it anymore. And that's kind of where we stand with it all right now. And that's why people want to trade Zion Williamson. That's why I'm frustrated, you're frustrated, other people are frustrated too. Might not matter, but it just always feels like it's something. And it's like, can we just watch basketball? Even if you're not necessarily winning, can we just watch basketball? You know, go out and play, but lose. That'd be a different story. But can we just watch basketball? And we're, we're just not. And that is tiring. So this stuff has to change. It has to change. Zion needs to make the changes now. Now. Or the team does need to move on because you can't. It goes back to what I said at the beginning of this part, right? Like you just can't. I can't keep living this way. It's kind of what they're saying, what you're saying can't keep doing this anymore. It's what it feels like. Game time has a new feature called game time picks that makes getting tickets for your favorite live events even easier. Game time picks filters out the fluff to show you only incredible deals on great seats. So you don't have to waste time searching through thousands of tickets. Curation makes it easier to save on sports, concerts, comedy, theater, and more near you. You can take the guesswork out of buying tickets with Game Time. Download the Game Time app, create an account, and use code Locked On for twenty dollars off your first ticket purchase. Terms apply. Again, create an account and redeem code Locked On for twenty dollars off. Download Game Time today. What time is it? Game Time. Boston Celtics squeak out of this one with a win over the Timberwolves. Jason, the first things first here. The uh, the Celtics. Three-point shooting. Three-point shooting was a big deal here because in the uh, throughout the course of the game, the Celtics had uh, a big advantage. They shot 56 of them, 21 of 56, 37 and a half percent. The gap closed in the fourth quarter, 15 uh, for of uh, 41 overall for the Timberwolves. In the fourth quarter, the Timberwolves hit six three-pointers. The Celtics hit three, and lo and behold, the Celtics gave up a 32-23 fourth quarter. Uh, Jalen Brown comes out and hits the first five of his shots. Uh, first five three-pointers. It's immediately 15 points for the Celtics. All of them belong to Jalen Brown. And uh, ultimately, uh, he was basically the entire offense. The Celtics put together 24 points in the first quarter uh, to the point where uh, Joe Mazzola changed his substitution pattern where he has been leaving Jalen Brown, uh, Jason Tatum in for entire fourth quarters. This time he pulled Tatum and put Brown in, uh, kept Brown in for the entire first quarter, just to try to keep some of that hot hand and, and hopefully uh, maybe he could get going a little bit. But ultimately three pointers, as usual with the Celtics, were the big story. The Celtics getting a ton of them up, making a ton of them. When they hit, when they hit 21 three pointers, uh, they are, uh, kind of hard to beat. And even uh, in a game like this where they lose it a little bit at the end, I think the fourth quarter was a – there was some bad defense, but I think the fourth quarter was just a little more uh, – the the 
Timberwolves got a little hot. The Celtics were missing some shots. They had some good looks. I still am looking for some more balance. I'm still looking for the Celtics to go inside a little bit, just like they did after we were talking about the uh, the win over the Washington Wizards, how the fourth quarter was just get it inside, back to the basket, hit those shots. think the Celtics can do that a little bit more. Still looking for that balance throughout the course of the game, but they st- they, they definitely still need to go to that, mix it in in the fourth quarter. Remember, I keep saying this. The fourth quarter, down the stretch, when you have a lead, it's just about making buckets. You cannot get outscored 32 to 23. You cannot put up 23 points in the fourth quarter. If they're going to score 32, then you better be scoring 30, right? I don't care that you lose the fourth quarter because you went into it with, I think, an 11-point lead. But you cannot, uh, you cannot lose it by nine. So you got to score. You got to make buckets. So I want to see Jason back to the basket stuff. I want to see Jalen back to the basket stuff, get it into the post and you can pass out of the post. I'm not looking, I'm not Shaquille O'Neal over here saying, Oh, you got to get into the post and you gotta, that's how you win game. Like, no, you don't have to be 1990s basketball, but I am saying that hitting, you know, taking those three pointers it's yes, the Celtics offense is a three point heavy offense. I get it. But also, you have to be able to do everything. You have to be able to get the ball into the paint. You have to get those touches. And if you're not getting the drives, then you got to do it some other way. And a post up is a great way to get that paint touch just to draw defense and kick it out. You can still take the three pointers. I don't care that they took three pointers in the fourth quarter. I just care that they uh, were, weren't were going uh, to some of the stuff that they, they could go to to make this a little bit, just breathe a little bit easier in this game. Uh, but anyway, the three-pointers are what they are, and that's where uh, I think the Celtics clearly had the advantage and struggled in the fourth quarter because the Timberwolves were making some. Nas Reed was making some. Uh, Dillingham was making some. Like Rob Dillingham's going to hit, you know, hit six of ten overall, two of four from three. Like that, that's a performance off the bench that the Celtics uh, cannot afford to give up. Uh, Celtics bench overall, what was this? Sixteen points. Well, Dillingham had fourteen on his own, plus nine, so twenty-three. They got beat there. Uh, a problem. That's that's a problem. And the Celtics bench scoring has been a little bit of an issue that we're not really focusing on right now, but it's a little bit of an issue. Maybe when Porzingis comes back and now Horford goes to the bench, that changes the dynamic there a little bit, regardless. Uh, Jalen Brown, obviously, first quarter dominant with the, with the three-point shooting. One thing I liked about Jason, I mean, with Jalen there, was he didn't he really didn't do overdo it. Uh, he, he admitted afterwards, like the sixth one, the seventh one, I didn't really like, but there was a point there. We had an open one in the left corner where that was a shot. I thought, okay, that, that that's one that I, he could take, but he gave it up. And then afterwards, Joe Missoula said, you know, I, I told him you're, you're giving up a shot that you should take. And he said, I wanted the rest of the team to get in rhythm. I wanted us all to find the rhythm. Uh, and that that is an important element. Such a tough uh, balance to strike when you're right out of the gate, first quarter, you're the guy that's hitting all of those shots. It's very much like the Golden State game last season when they were just leaving him, except they weren't leaving him in this game. He was just hitting, hitting, hitting. He takes a heat check, no problem. Of course you're gonna take a heat check in that situation. I would. Every every basketball player would take that heat check. Not an issue. Uh, the fact that he started to try to move the ball and get other other guys going, and they were missing shots. So I, I applaud Jalen for trying to find that and trying to find that balance. Uh, I think it was a smart move by Missoula not to pull him. I think a lot of people would have been questioning Missoula in that moment if he had pulled Jason. Or I keep saying Jason. If he had pulled Jalen out and people would have been like, how do you pull the hot hand? How do you sit the hot hand? Um, you know, in retrospect, you might be saying like, 
you know, you you could have after he missed the couple pulled him left Jason in to see if you can get some ball movement and some other guys could get going. But uh, I thought Jalen was beyond that was pretty good. He had uh, 29 points overall, just one turnover, which is great. Um, a steal, a block, uh, that block in the first quarter. I'll talk about that block when we talk about Derek white, because that was a great play from Jalen but it was a, gr a really great recognition from Derek White, and I want to save it for that. Uh, four assists for him. In fact, the assists were pretty well spread out. Four for Brown, four for Tatum, uh, four for Horford, five for, for Derek White, three for Holiday, three for Pritchard, two for Hauser. I mean, that's a nice little distribution there. Ball movement wasn't bad. Um, Jalen, at the end, hits the dagger shot another play where Derek White was the guy with the driver of that play, but also the last possession, great defense from Jalen Brown. The, the Timberwolves had seven seconds. This is such a key uh, 